Dunedin Pace may be the best epigenetic clock for predicting the speed of epigenetic aging. And one reason for that is shown here. This was a two-year study where people were calorie-restricted by 12%. And that's in comparison with people who were ad-lib, who ate as much as they wanted whenever they wanted. So on the y-axis, we've got the change in Dunedin pace. This is the change in the epigenetic pace of aging as measured by Dunedin pace. And then there were three time points on the x-axis. Baseline, 12 and 24 months after starting the intervention. So for people who were 12% calorie restricted for two years, they had a significantly slower epigenetic pace of aging as indicated by Dunedin pace, but compared with the group who ate as much as they wanted whenever they wanted. Now that's a potentially important finding because other gold standard epigenetic clocks, including Horvath, PhenoAge, and GrimAge, were not able to detect a slower epigenetic pace of aging for people that were calorie restricted for two years which suggests that Dunedin pace may be a more sensitive metric for being able to detect those changes. So with that in mind, what's my data? To find out, I sent blood to True Diagnostic, and if you want to measure your own Dunedin pace and other epigenetic tests, discount link in the video's description. So the most recent test that I have data for was on September 6th. It takes about a month to get the results, and this is test number six in 2024. So on that day, Dunedin pace was 0.88. What does that mean? So the slowest epigenetic aging rate would be 0.6, and the fastest epigenetic aging rate would be 1.4. So 0.88 is far from terrible, but I've got some room for improvement to get to that slowest epigenetic aging rate, as the name of the channel is Conquer Aging or Die Trying, not do a little bit better than you know chronological age in terms of slowing the epigenetic pace of aging. Now, note that this is just one test, and it's important to not get too high or too low about one test. So with that in mind, I test year-to-year -year changes with the goal of, at worst, slowing, uh, you know, flatlining biomarkers so they're not age-related increase or age-related decrease, keeping them constant at worst. At best, moving them closer towards youth. So with that in mind, what's my data over 17 tests as I've been tracking Dunedin Pace since 2022? And that's what we'll see here with Dunedin pace values on the y-axis plotted against collection date or time on the x. So in 2022, over three tests, average Dunedin pace was 0.84. And then thinking that three tests over a full year period may not be enough to track year-to-year -year changes or to get a full year average with only three tests, I tested more often in 2023, eight times. And over those eight tests, Dunedin pace was 0.80. Now, that's better and moving in the right direction, but whether that's a closer representation of my full year average or whether I did stuff that actively decreased my epigenetic piece of pace of aging by a relatively small amount, I'm not sure. Probably a little bit of both. All right, so what about in 2024? So over six tests, average Dunedin pace is 0.84, which includes the most recent test of 0.88, which is back to where I started, unfortunately, in 2022, 0.84, not as good as in 2023. So at worst, when considering all 17 tests, we can see that Danita Pace is mostly stable with an average Danita Pace of 0.82. Now, there may be a weakness in the, these data, and that's because two of the last three tests have been worse than average, 0.91 and 0.88 on that last test. And that's potentially important because Danita Pace increases during aging. And that's what we'll see here, with Dunedin pace values on the y-axis plotted against chronological age on the x. And in terms of that age-related increase, we can see it indicated by the red line. In other words, for people of older chronological ages, it's less likely to see a relatively younger Dunedin pace. In contrast, for people in their 20s, it's more likely to see relatively low Dunedin pace values, say 0.6, relative to someone of an older chronological age. So with that in mind, that's one reason that the Rejuvenation Olympics leaderboard, which is based on Dunedin Pace, is likely to be dominated by people at the top of the list who are in their early 20s relative to older age groups. Also in this plot, we can see my most recent data with that green circle highlighted by the red rectangle, which is pretty close to average for my chronological age, which again is like a, a dirty word to me, you know, having age expected values. So with that in mind, the goal is to get it obviously to 0.6, which would be great for my chronological age, but also great for any chronological age. So with that in mind, how can I improve Dunedin pace? So for that, let's take a look at 17 test correlations 
for diet with Dunedin Pace. And following each test, I calculate correlations. So after this test, I calculated correlations for 99 foods, macro, and micronutrients with Dunedin Pace over those 17 tests, with the top portion of the list shown here. And if you're interested in seeing the full list of correlations, that's on the correlations tier on Patreon. Now, before going into the data, what's the approach? How am I able to calculate correlations for diet or even supplements with biomarkers? And I've covered that in many other videos, the most recent in a video on tar taurine. So if you missed that, it'll be in the right corner. All right, so back to the list. In terms of what's significant, we go to the p-value column. And generally, values less than 0.05 are statistically significant. In this case, we can see that not, nothing on the list is less than 0.05. The closest uh, metric or va variable that's le to, to being less than 0.05 is fiber but that's actually in a direction opposite to what I would expect, thinking that relatively higher fiber should be better for the epigenetic pace of aging. So what do I do with this information? Even though fiber is not significant, it's close. So the fiber intake range over these 17 tests is 79 to 91 grams per day. Now, when considering that fiber's correlation with Dunedin pace is positive, that suggests that when fiber has been towards the lower end of my range, that's correlated. Notice I didn't say significantly correlated. It's correlated with a lower Dunedin pace. And when my fiber intakes have been towards the higher end of that range, 91 grams per day, that's correlated with an older or a faster uh, Dunedin pace. So with that in mind, for the next test, test number 18, my average daily fiber intake since the September 6th test is 80 grams per day. So if fiber has anything to do with Dunedin pace, when considering that I'm following the correlation, aiming for the lower end of my fiber intake range, I should expect to see a slower epigenetic pace of aging. But the obvious weakness in that approach is that fiber is not significantly associated or correlated with Dunedin pace. So with that in mind, as you saw in the title of this video, it's time to dig deeper. So which biomarkers is Dunedin pace based on? And we can see the full list shown here. Dunedin paste is an epigenetic approximation of 19 biomarkers, all 19 that are shown here. Now this is new, and I don't think many people have seen these data, so I think it's important to walk through the 19 biomarkers. So they include HbA1c, metabolic health. They include measures of cardiovascular fitness. So cardiorespiratory fitness is VO2 max. So this uh, Dunedin Pace is an epigenetic approximation of people's VO2 max. That was one of the biomarkers that was included in this uh, uh, metric. It also includes lung function measures, FEV1 divided by the FVC, and also FEV1 on its own, and then blood pressure, mean arterial pressure. So if you're familiar with the channel, I track lung function, FEV1, blood pressure, and although I've measured VO2 max, uh, I'm going to start tracking that at some point in the future, probably... Uh, in 2025, late 2025. I, I can't go into the why about that yet, but uh, if anybody's uh, interested, uh, I can give some hints in the uh, comments. It also includes measures like BMI and waist to hip ratio, so measures relative or related to body composition, white blood cell telomere length, two markers of kidney function, uh, gum health, so oral health is a part of this epigenetic approximation, white blood cell counts, and then we've got measures related to lipoproteins, and lipids, so triglycerides, total cholesterol, HDL, and then the ApoB100 to ApoA1 ratio. Now last, but potentially not least, is lipoprotein A. And as we'll see, lipoprotein A in my data has always been relatively high, which may be a reason why I've yet to see values less than around 0.74. So let's take a look at that data. First starting with, is lipoprotein A correlated with Dunedin Pace? as I have data for eight tests, venipuncture, with Dunedin Pace finger prick on the same day. And that's what we'll see here. So this is Dunedin Pace versus lipoprotein A. Again, eight tests from May of 2022 through August of 2023. On the y-axis, we've got Dunedin Pace, and that's on the x, we've got lipoprotein A. Now note that the lipoprotein A reference range is less than 75 nan nanomolar. So even for just these eight tests, I'm higher than the reference range. And that's almost always been the case. Lipoprotein A levels have been thought to be genetically predetermined. And there's almost nothing that, you know, supposedly, there's almost nothing that we can do to reduce them. So 
I've always been on the relatively high side of that reference range, just outside of it. And in terms of all-cause mortality risk, it's not high enough to be uh, associated with all-cause mortality risk, which is good news. But I'd like to have it obviously lower when assuming that it's a part of the Dunedin Pace algorithm. So in terms of the correlation, we can see that it's close to relatively strong. The correlation coefficient is 0.6. A strong correlation would be greater than 0.7. But the p-value is just outside of significance at 0.11 for the correlation for Dunedin Pace with lipoprotein A. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not uh, significantly, co I, that means that they're not significantly correlated, but it's possible that they are significantly correlated and that eight tests may not be enough to detect that as a significant correlation. So with that in mind, I'm going to continue. Well, I'm going to add it back into the approach. I stopped tracking it for a while. I'm going to add it back into the approach, and we'll see how this story plays out if lipoprotein A is significantly correlated with the Dunedin Pace as I collect more data. But when considering that lipoprotein A is a part of the Dunedin Pace algorithm, can I reduce it? Now, even just without going further, just when considering that on this plot over these eight tests, I have a, a lipoprotein A range from 80 to 100 uh, nanomolar, that 20 nanomolar range suggests that there's a recipe involved in keeping it relatively low or relatively higher in that range. It's not exactly 80 nanomolar for every test. If it was, that would argue that it literally is hard to change because maybe it is genetically predetermined. So I do have a range. Discovering how to keep it towards the low end of my range is a part of the story or part of the fun or part of the challenge, depending on how you look at it. So in terms of answering the question, can I reduce lipoprotein A? The first starting point for me always is, are any foods or nutrients significantly correlated? And one food that is significantly correlated is cacao bean intake. So I buy whole cacao beans, grind them myself, and make sort of a homemade chocolate by mixing it with medjool dates. So now we're about to see lipoprotein A data in correlation with cacao beans, and this is in 24 tests from August of 2018 through August of 2023. And if you're interested in the full list, because there are a few other foods or nutrients that are significantly correlated with lipoprotein A, the full list is on Patreon. All right, so in terms of the correlation for lipoprotein A with cacao, we'll see that here. With lipoprotein A values on the y-axis, plotted against the average daily cocoa bean or cacao bean intake on the x. And for those who may not know, I've been tracking diet every day since 2015 using a food scale. So these values are as close to accurate or as close to, yeah, accurate as, as one can get. In terms of the correlation, we can see that there is a significant inverse correlation for cocoa bean intake with lipoprotein A. As the correlation coefficient is negative 0.42 and the p-value is less than 0.05 at 0.04. In other words, when cocoa bean intake has been relatively high, that's been significantly correlated with relatively lower lipoprotein A values. So with that in mind, once I discovered this correlation about 10 days ago, I thought, all right, I'm going to test it. So I've increased cocoa bean intake over the past 10 days to an average of 19 grams per day. And I'm going to test again very soon. So I'll have about four, to, well, not about, I'll have 14 days with about 20 grams of cocoa bean intake per day to test this correlation. Now, I can already hear in the comments that 14 days may not be enough to make a dent on epigenetic changes, or including Dunedin Pace. So with that in mind, I'm going to keep uh, cocoa bean intake high for at least the next six weeks after that when I plan on retesting to see if, this is, you know, if cocoa bean intake can make a dent or not. Now, in terms of the 20 gram uh, dose or 19 to 20 gram dose, what change or what value, what, what, what's the expected outcome on lipoprotein A? So based on extrapolation of this plot right here, 19 grams per day of cocoa beans would be correlated with a lipoprotein A of about 80 nanomolar towards the low end of my range. All right, how does 80 nanomolar correlate with Dunedin Pace? So now we go over to the left plot, and there we could see that based on extrapolation of that correlation, it may lead to a lipoprotein A value close to my lowest level of 0.74. Now, will it work? Will this story play out the way I hope? I don't know but I'm retesting or testing on October 18th, just a few days away. It takes about a month for results to come in. So expect an update sometimes to, sometime towards mid-November, uh, towards late November, maybe even early December. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself while help, helping to support the channel, including epigenetic testing, Ulta Lab Test, which is where I get the majority of my 
non-epigenetic or metabolomic testing done, at-home metabolomics, NAD quantification, or microbiome composition, at-home blood, te blood testing with Cyfox Health, which includes ApoB, but also Grimage, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.